Blackwork embroidery, um, it actually dates back to the ninth century um, for the existing examples that we have in museums. Blackwork um, that we know of originated around Egypt between the ninth um, to the 15th centuries. And um, this Egyptian embroidery, it was a counted thread technique, usually two threads using a double running stitch with um, largely geometric plant and animal motifs. The Moors and the Mamluks were Muslims that were originally part of the, I'll probably mispronounce this, the Umayyad Caliphate. Um, a caliphate is an Islamic state um, led by someone like a priest king, both a uh, religious and political leader over a territory. And the Islamic world expanded and eventually ruled over Northern Africa, including Egypt, and then later into the Iberian Peninsula, which includes Spain. And here are some examples of the Egyptian embroidery. And here are some more examples. As far as um, the difference between a Moor and a Mamluk, um, the Mamluk was actually a term used for someone who was a slave that ended up um, being in the military and becoming a higher up. And so they ended up being authority figures, the Moors were simply, um, that was a name that was given for people of black descent to differentiate them from the Romans and um, anyone else that was in Spain. Um, here is a map of the trade routes from the 11th through the 12th centuries with the, whoop, sorry about that with the um, trade routes and um, also the Moorish occupation of Spain, blackwork embroidery was able to go through Europe and became popular during the 16th and 17th centuries. And here are some examples of European blackwork. You can see the sleeves for Bess of Hardwick. In the full portrait, um, she also has blackwork along the collar. And then the other one is um, an enhanced picture of Jane Seymour's cuffs. Jane Seymour was the third wife of Henry VIII. So what's black work? Black work is a reversible embroidery stitch, usually done with silk thread on linen. Over the centuries, black work has also been referred to as Holbein stitch, back stitch, Spanish work, festoon stitch, square stitch, or double running stitch. By counting the threads, the double running stitch, it's a series of two journeys. The first journey, the pattern is to work every other stitch, so it looks like a, a dotted line. And then on the return journey, you fill in the blank spots to create one continuous line. So what materials do you need? A slate frame is preferred. That's more historically accurate. If you don't have a slate frame, then you can use a a hoop frame, but that actually did not, um, hoop frames did not become popular until I believe it was the 18th century with, um, I think it's pronounced tamper work. Aside from the frame, you'll also need your linen fabric, silk thread, needle, beeswax is optional. I recommend it for at least the, the ends of your thread and then pattern. Here's um, an idea of what slate frames look like. There's one example, it's German um, from 1568. That's the engraving. There's also a painting from the mid 1400s. And then what type of needle would you use? Um, honestly, I use whatever needle I happen to have. Um, a lot of them I've gotten from cross stitch kits. Then as far as the type of silk thread, I recommend using and I'll probably mispronounce this as well, the soy perle. It's a twisted silk thread that you only need the beeswax to apply to the ends. There's also a soy oval, which it's untwisted silk thread. It's shinier than the twisted silk thread, but I found that with the soy oval, it tends to fray more. 
Blue, red, and brown, um, it could be faded black, were common embroidery threads in pre-15th century Egyptian embroidery. The brown threads that we see in the examples and museums today may have originally been black since the iron used to dye the threads can, um, the, the iron can erode over time and erode the thread. Black silk thread on white linen was definitely the most favored in Europe. Red thread was occasional, occasionally used. In England, gold and silver threads were also used. However, due to the sumptuary laws, there was a restriction on this that gold and silver and pearl embroidery, it was only reserved for dukes, marquises, earls, and including the children of all three, viscounts, barons, and gentlemen of the garter. Here's an example of a woman's Italian shirt from the late 16th century in the Textile Museum in Prado. Um, can Guterman silk thread be used? Guterman silk thread, if you happen to see my video footage, I can show you this more in a minute. It's thinner, it is machine washable, so it's a nice thread to learn to work on especially if you want to buy it cheap, you can use like a Joanne Fabrics coupon and get it at a discounted rate. But if you're going for historical accuracy or if you want a thread that is more bold, then I would recommend not using this because it just, it's thin. If you look in the bottom, let's see, the bottom left picture, you can see the top thread looks much thinner while the other two are bolder. The picture of the cuffs on the right, that was actually a shirt I had made for my son when he was about five years old, and he ended up wearing it as his um, as his youth boffer um, shirt. And that's the one nice thing: the Guterman silk thread. It is machine washable because since he was doing youth combat in this shirt, it got washed a lot. The embroidery or the Moorish embroidery had been used to decorate various household items such as towels, napkins, cushion covers, as well as garments such as robes and veils. In Europe, clothes were mainly the items that were embroidered, and these included the shirt sleeves, ruffs, cuffs, coifs, doublets, nightcaps, falling bands, along with handkerchiefs. Now, what about pattern? There are many options as far as a pattern. Here's two examples. These are samplers. One is an Italian sampler from the 16th century. There's also Jane Bostock's sampler from 1598. You can also find other examples of physical items that exist in um, different museums. You can also look at, um, look at other samplers. You can look at paintings. So there are options out there. Here's a simple pattern to maybe start out with. The first one on the left, it's a silk linen, um, silk thread on linen. It's Egyptian, it's from about the 13th or 14th century. You can also find books that also provided patterns. This one uh, on the right is Nicholas Basset's pattern from the new model book, and that one's German. Or if you really want a simple pattern, if you look at closely at this lady's neckline, it's a simple dashed line. I don't know how much more simple you can get with black work. So to do black work, um, like I said before, you um, first you wanna weave your thread in and out and you wanna start from one side of the fabric and go to the other side. And once you have completed that, that is your first journey. And then you want to then go back and complete your second journey, filling in all of the spaces. If you look underneath where I say um, return journey in the picture, it shows one, two, three, four, five to the end and then turn and then go six, seven, eight, nine. I recommend weaving the tail of your thread on the underneath side of the pattern. Another option is you can tie the, the end of the thread, tie a knot in it. The only thing with that is if you tie a knot, I actually had one that I put through the washing machine and the knot pulled through the linen. So lots of tears with that, but knots are an option or weave the tail. Another thing, if you weave the tail, as you can see in these examples on the left and the right, 
I took the full thread and wove it in. If you're in the middle of the pattern, you can actually take the thread and split it in half and then weave one half on one side of the pattern and the other on the other side, and then you won't get as much of a bulky line as you do here on the ends of the, the threads. The picture in the middle is actually the backside of a sampler from 1701. I know that's out of our time period, but it's still embroidery to give you an idea of what a backside would have looked like on a sampler. And then once you've embroidered your piece, then you attach it to your garment. It helps to measure out the frame compared to the size of the, the item that you're stitching. If you look in the bottom left picture, you'll see where I've got two rows of, it just looks like a line with crosses. I had to measure my husband's neck because my frame is only 15 by 15, while his neck size is larger than 15 inches. So I ended up having to split the pattern in half and then put a seam in the middle and merge the two side by side on the back. And um, if you want a challenge, black work, has a, it also inspired this. It's actually reversible cross stitch. So that was one thing I did not know was a thing until last year that reversible cross stitch also existed. Um, let me get out of that. And as far as how to do black work, let me try to move my thing here. See if this will play. And this will show you more of how to do black work itself. Hey Lynn, you may have to go back, you may have to go out of screen sharing and then go back into it for the video portion. Oh, so I have to stop sharing and go back to sharing? Yeah, try that. And then when you bring up your video, then hit the screen share again. All this tech is so much fun to learn. <laughs> yep. Sorry about that. No, I'm you're fine. Learning. Okay, let here me we go. back here. Real quick with that in the video, um, I mentioned um, doing every third or fifth hole. When you look at the linen fabric, you'll see um, the holes are pretty easy to look at. And with that, you just have to determine on your pattern how big or how small you want the pattern. If you do every third hole, the pattern tends to be, um, I don't know if you can see the video, I'll show you when this video is done, but it tends to, the, to be smaller and more intricate in detail, but if you do every fifth hole, then the pattern is larger and it doesn't take up as much time trying to embroider it as it does every third hole. But. Lynn, I'm sorry yes. to stop you. Will you turn on the, um, the computer screen sound? If you, if you go back out and stop your screen share, and then there would be a little button that says share with computer sound and then the because the video is playing just oh. the, uh, the sound is on it oh so did no one hear me with that one no we heard you but not the video <laughs> oh okay you see where it pops up now and says okay all right hit play and we'll see if it i'm going to do this let's see if that okay can i ask you a can question you... real quick before you go sure. on? Why is it you're choosing odd numbers instead of even numbers? Like you talked about making it three versus five as opposed to like two and four? Uh, personal preference. Um, okay. I think two, because um, you'd pretty much be going in one hole and down the next hole. And I think that would make it just too small. And then you would, if you look at some of the patterns, it would just, I think that would be very difficult and too small to do. Um, you could do four holes. It, it's personal preference. Okay. I just want to make sure it wasn't having to do with the design feature. No, um, 
like I said, when you look more at patterns, um, you can then decide on how big or how small. Um, after I show this video, I can um, actually, well, with the pattern that I showed you um, before in the um, PowerPoint where it showed my husband's cuffs, um, I learned the hard way I should have done every third hole. Instead, I did every fifth hole, and that made the pattern too large because the pattern on his cuffs was supposed to be a mirror image of itself, but the pattern ended up being too big. So unless I wanted his cuffs to be like five or six inches wide or long, however you want, but I'll show you that in a minute. Okay. But here's how to do black. Which spot you want to start at and pull your thread through, but you don't want to pull it all the way through. You want to make sure you have a little bit of a tail and hold on to it because you're going to weave it into the back side of your pattern. And then from here, I'm going to count over five holes. Let's see, three. And then once I count over five holes, I pull my needle through. Make sure you don't pull all the way, or pull your tail all the way through. Now, I'm going to count over five more holes. So three, five. Now, as I pull this one through, I'm going to flip it to the back side and make sure that my tail is woven into my thread. This will help secure my thread so as I continue to embroider, it will not unravel. And see, I have now secured it. And then from here, I'm going to do another five holes. And do the same thing again. Count over five holes. Flip it to the back side. And I want to get my tail woven in. And then once I know it's in there, then I pull tight. And sometimes I like to pull my tail tight just to make sure that it works. And then from here, I'm going to do my first up stitch. As you can see, already I'm doing every other stitch. So as you continue to work your piece, it looks more like a dotted line. And then this is known as the first journey. And then once you finish, finish your first journey, then you will go backwards and fill in all of your spaces to make one continuous looking line. So from here, I'm going to go up five spaces diagonally. As you can see, I like to use my needle to um, as my placeholder as I count my threads to make sure that I've counted up and over the right number of spaces that I need. And I do the same thing from underneath the linen. I don't know if you're able to see my needle or not, where I count up, one, two, three. And then once I know I'm in the hole, I'm going to tuck my tail into my thread again. And then pull my thread tight. You always want to make sure that your threads are nice and tight. That way you have good tension on your fabric. Otherwise, if your threads are loose, then your thread on the back side can come loose, plus also it just looks sloppy. And then from here, if you see on the pattern, sorry, if you see on the pattern, I've gone up one, up two, um, diagonally. Now I'm going to go vertically up one, horizontally over one, and then vertically down one. And then I will return back the way I came and then do the same thing on the right side. So from here, I'm going to go up five vertically. Now 
Now I'm going to use my needle on the back side and count over five horizontally. And if you have done this all correctly, this hole, this stitch up here should be in the same line as the stitch down here. That way everything looks very even and everything is geometrically pleasing. And then with my next stitch, it should be horizontally, it should be in line with this stitch right here, and it should also be in line with that stitch right there. And then I'm going to go back up to my first stitch. And I just realized I went through the wrong hole. I went one up too far, so I'm going to stick my needle in and pull back out. And go back through the correct hole. And see, pull tight there. And then go through there. And then come back through here. Now I'm going to do the same thing on the right side. I'm going to count over five holes. And then I'm going to count down five holes. And again, this stitch right here should be in line with the stitch up here and also with the stitch over here. If things do not line up perfectly, then you need to go back and count your holes because somewhere you either may have added one too many um, holes or not enough. And now I'm going to go back the way I came. And I'm going to go up. And over. to my original line and from here I'm going to count over five holes and count over five holes again and as you can see this stitch right here is in line with that stitch there everything runs evenly and perfectly and I pull it through and it helps to go back to your pattern and make sure you're doing everything correctly on this specific pattern there's one two three four five spaces in between each little I guess leaf so as you can see I've done one on the back side there's two on the front side three so I need four and five. So I'm counting over five holes. That's number four. Once you have come to the end of your line of your first journey, then it's time to fill in the blanks. And from here, you just go back the way you, way you came and fill in the blanks. This is actually a lot easier because you don't have to count spaces anymore. You just have to make sure you get in the same hole that your original stitch is in. As I fill in my line, not only does it look like one continuous line on the front side, but if I flip it on the back side, here, I'll do it right side up, it looks exactly the same on the back, just the mirror image of what was on the front.
Okay, so there's a basics on that. Um, with some of the questions that were asked before, if you can see here, um, this is doing it every third hole. That can show you how small that is. And then to give you, I'll use this to kind of give you an idea. This is every fifth hole. So as you can see, one looks a lot smaller and one looks a lot bigger. Um, for that pattern that I started to mention earlier, as far as doing every third or fifth hole, from where I learned the hard way, um, you can see this pattern right here. Do you see how it's supposed to be a mirror image of the top and the bottom? Well, I did every fifth hole on my husband's cuff, and this is two inches right here. So unless I wanted a cuff that was four inches up his arm, I could only do half of the pattern. So that's where you have to decide if you want to do every third hole or every fifth hole. Um, does anyone have any questions? Or um, in the chat, there's a question, and it says, uh, you pointed out that red thread was sometimes used. Were other colors of linen used, even if white was clearly favored? Um, with Egyptian embroidery, they actually used um, unbleached linen, so it was an off-white color. But with um, European embroidery, they could have um, th they could have also used it on um, other fabrics, like you could have found it on, uh, well, Cotton was one that was sometimes used, but I've actually embroidered on cotton and I don't recommend it because it's a pain. <sighs> but that's also because I was actually trying to count the holes. Um, other fabrics were also used um, like silks and stuff, but um, the linen, um, it was usually white linen was the most favored. And if anyone has any questions, feel free at this time to unmute and go ahead and ask. No one jump up at once. <laughs> I have a question actually. So you talked about um, the silver and gold work. Is that the same? I would be using the same patterns as the black work or would they have their own specific different kinds? Because I've seen some examples on like, um, now I can't think, Elizabethan embroidery where it's kind of like very thick like lines, like curling lines. Is that the same sort of black work or is that more of a embroidery type situation? Of course, I don't um, have a picture of it right now either. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, with it, it could have been used for the black work. It may have been used for just kind of an accent. Like it may have only been on part of the embroidery, not the whole, like not the whole cuff, but just like a little, I don't know, accent on a leaf or something like that. But because of the sumptuary laws, you had to watch it as far as who could use it and who could not. So does that help answer the question? Okay. Did the silver or gold work, was it, was it laid out geometrically, like more geometrically like black work was as well? Uh, yes. Um, also with the black work, um, as you got um, into later period, that um, specifically with England, they like the curvy linear type of embroidery. So then that's where you find more of the, like the, the swirly type black work that was the later period. The Moors had, um, they loved everything that had symmetry to it. So with the Moors, everything was geometric. But then as it made its way through Europe, things got like, like I said, in England, they had more curvy linear lines. And so with that, that's where you could have like the gold or the silver accenting certain curves or like I said, leaves or anything like that. I was trying to follow along with the timeline a little bit. Could you review the European timeline a little bit of when we really start to see black word work come through the continent? Sure. Um, with um, em the embroidery, you see it um, as early as the ninth century in Egypt, um, and that like goes up to about the 15th, almost into the 16th century, and then through like the trade and the um, the Moorish occupation of with Spain, 
it started to um, filter in um, in the 15th century through Europe and it went through Italy, um, through German, um, through like Spain, France and into England. Um, actually, there is a quote, um, I'd have to look it up, where Chaucer actually makes reference to black work embroidery and I believe it's the Miller's Wife's Tale. So black work did, like it existed in England, but it didn't really become popular until Catherine of Aragon, um, the first wife of Henry VIII, until she moved to um, England and then really made it popular. But does that help? Okay. Yes, thank you. No problem. And would you mind telling me a little bit about your experience with black work? When did you like when did you start? When did it become something you're passionate about? Um, actually, I started black work about half of my life ago um, when I was 17. Um, a gentleman, his name is Gregor Burkardis. He is from the Barony of Flaming Griffin. And at Harvest Day, he, I believe it was Harvest Day, he taught a class on black work embroidery. And I had already done cross stitch. My mom taught me how to do cross stitch. And, so, okay, I'll take a class. And then when I took the class, well, when I do cross stitch embroidery, um, how I outline my cross stitch, well, how I outlined it, that's when I discovered, oh, this is black work. Just, it's the exact same thing because I, I, did, I didn't want to use up any more of my thread than I had to. So I would do every other line and then I would go back. And so I started, um, learned a little bit. I started to dabble. Um, I actually, I first started with embroidery floss and because I thought it was cheaper, which depending on where you buy your thread, and yes, it could be cheaper. I also learned the hard way. It could be a real pain to work with. And then I was told, try silk thread. It's historically accurate and you'll enjoy it much more. And when I first started to work with the silk thread and the first knot I had in it easily pulled out in the opposite direction and the knot was gone. Oh, I haven't gone back. <laughs> no, I'm looking to see if I have an example of that, but. Um, yeah, um, here's one that I did with the silk thread, or sorry, the embroidery floss. And like right here is a knot and with the, embroidery floss because I would take one strand out of the bundle of six it tends to coil up on itself and knot on itself and then once there's a knot it's almost impossible to pull out and so then you would just have to try to weave your mistake into your pattern but yes um, since then I started when I was 17 and just learned things here learned things there um, I made a sampler. This one is 16th century um, Italian. Let's see, this one actually is a partlet I did. This is where I learned the hard way with, um, to use, I prefer twisted silk thread rather than untwisted. And that's because if you look on the underneath side, um, I'm trying to zoom in, if you can see where the thread is fraying a lot, that's also where I learned beeswax. Beeswax is also good to put on the end. So got my little beeswax here. <laughs> so. <laughs> I was gonna ask, you were talking about um, they found examples of red used instead of black. Was there any significance to the red thread versus the black thread? Kind of like how you said the gold and silver embroidery was just for the higher status people. Was red have any significance versus black? Or any other color? Um, not well. With the Egyptians, um, or that with the Egyptians, it was just that was one of the thread colors that was used for European. I haven't found anything with the sumptuary laws, but um, specifically Bess of Hardwick, her she's who comes to mind. But just the sleeves, and I guess that would have been a way to, I guess, show yourself off. Um, because black work, it became really popular in um, England because there, were, because of the sumptuary laws, there was a tax on lace. So the black work they could put on the ends of things to look like lace, and then 
So have the appearance of lace, but not actually have to pay the tax for wearing lace. And for someone like Bessa Hardwick, you want to show off how much money you have. So, yep. Yeah. But I've also read that black was also um, considered a possible favorite because of the printing press, that that may have had something to do with the popularity with the color black. Are you familiar with um, the application of black work in an ecclesial setting? versus the secular setting where they used the same way or not so much in the church as in the secular world um i know that um like i'm trying to think of um i think it's called opus anglicum i'm probably butchering that but i know in um with the church that was the preferred type of embroidery and then black work was more used um, for people to wear on their sleeves and stuff. So now I haven't really found it in any kind of church garments or anything like that. I've got some more modern pattern books for black work and they have a lot of like making an outline of a shape and then filling it in with a black work pattern. Was that, how, how um, when did that happen? I guess um, part of it, um, I would think, would just simply depend on the pattern um, as far as, because what you have, when you have a complicated pattern, you have to um, figure out sort of, you have to look at it and sort of map out what you're going to do. Um, specifically, one comes to mind, it looks like a lattice pattern. And um, I believe it was on a collar, um, but it looks like, it's kind of interwoven, like if I go, I don't know if you can see me going like this. And so then you had to figure out on that pattern, which thread was going to go up and down, and then the next thread, which one was going to go up and down so you don't have threads overlapping. But as far as exactly when they would outline and then fill it in, I don't know exactly when that started. Personally, I find it easier to start from one side and go down and over because with linen, especially if you have linen that is not perfectly symmetrical, you'll find some of your um, embroidered, um, some of your stitches might be wider than they are longer or vice versa. And so then if you outline everything and then try to fill everything in, you may find your whole pattern doesn't fit inside that outline. So it's easier to work from one corner and work your way down and over. So, what the hell?